The first speaker today is George Weinstock, who um, joined Jack's GM recently, um, maybe in the last year or 18 months, as Associate um, Director of Microbial Gene uh, Genomics. And before, um, George was at WashU, where he was a professor and Associate Director of the Genome Institute at WashU. And as you heard this morning, um, George is really an expert and has been a leader in the field of microbiome study, and I'm hoping that's what he's going to talk about. It looks like it. Thanks, Sue. So um, uh, it's just fabulous to be here giving a talk on this uh, exciting historic event at this symposium. Um, this is the token microbiology talk that goes on in genomics nowadays. And it's customary to have a talk on the microbiome immediately after you've eaten. <laughs> so I, I will do my best to discreetly be gross, and, uh, but not so much so that it's a problem. So this is uh, the title, How Metagenomics Will Change Medicine. I thought I would give a, a slightly different kind of talk because of the, the moment and the significance of this. Um, and here's the bottom line. If you've had a lot of lunch and the chairs are very comfortable and you might start to nod off, I'll tell you right now, metagenomics will change medicine. That's the conclusion from this talk. So um, there may not be a lot of microbiologists in the crowd, so I'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about what metagenomics and microbiome means. Um, and her colleagues in a paper in 1998 uh, like Eric pointed out, genomics was, the genome was defined in 1987, and so metagenomics and microbiome came after that. So we're an even newer field than the field of genomics. Um, uh, Joe was talking about uh, the collective genomes of soil microflora, which we term the metagenome of the soil. And the concept here, she was just randomly cloning DNA out of the soil in screening all of the genes that she pulled out of there for antibiotic resistance and, and other interesting properties. And so she had the concept that actually there's a metagenome, there's a genome in the soil. All of the collective bacteria that are there put all their chromosomes together and call that a genome, a multi-chromosomal genome. And so she called that the metagenome. And that's one of the sort of cornerstone concepts of this field is that whether it's our body, whether it's the soil, whether it's the ocean, wherever it is, there is a constellation of microorganisms there, and we think of their genomes almost as a unity, so we call it the metagenome. So that's what we're going to be talking about, how, the, how metagenomics, the study of the metagenome, is going to change medicine. And the microbiome is the other key word here, and that was a term that was coined by Josh Letterberg in a, a commentary in 2001, a few years after Joe wrote hers. So you can see this is all kind of new terminology and new concepts. Um, in, his, in his commentary, he defined the microbiome as the ecological community of microorganisms that literally share our body space. So there's several important concepts there. First of all, you think about all the microorganisms in your body as a community but an ecological community. In other words, they're not just a bunch of independent organisms that you're carrying around with you, but, but rather there's an integrated whole here. There's a community that's, that's doing something together. And um, literally share our body space, uh, that means that they're really part of us. We sh we're sharing this together. That, that metagenome of the microbiome, now you'll know what both of those words mean, and our genome are, are working in synchrony. And elsewhere in his commentary, uh, Josh Letterberg goes on to talk about us as a superorganism, which is all of those microorganisms plus ourselves together is a superorganism because of all of the commonalities of what's going on. So if we were to do a head count of cells in our body, we would find out that we are 90% microbiome and only 10% human cells. So 
as you've had a nice lunch now, all of your microbiome is busy at work feeding itself, and your cells, your own cells are getting some of that. But some of the things that your own cells are getting are things that the microbiome has also broken down, and that's one of the functions that your microbiome does for you. And um, when we think about uh, the scale of this, there's, there are more bacteria in your mouth than there are people on the Earth. I mean, this is a very rich, this is a, an enormously complex ecological community that you're carrying around with you. And, and they're busy at work right now in your mouth, I'm sure. Now, if we look at just um, one part of your mouth, just saliva, and we enumerate what are the different taxa that are present there, you get a picture like this. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different bacterial species present, and their abundances can vary tremendously. Uh, streptococci tend to be a very major uh, bacteria in saliva, and uh, other, other bacteria you can see are, are, can be much less uh, prevalent than that. But in other parts of your body where you have microbial communities, the structure of those communities can be quite different. Uh, you, you have different dominant organisms there, um, but you still have a very rich collection of organisms. The different parts of your body are different ecological niches. If we go back to the idea of this is an ecological community, you have aerobic and anaerobic parts of your body. You have nutrient-rich and nutrient-poor parts of your body, oily or not oily. Um, parts of your skin can be like deserts where there's very little there. And so the particular organisms that get selected and that form communities and that colonize, occupy, and take over that niche are different in, in each of these cases. And, and then associated with this, if we did a head count, uh, we have 10 times more microorganisms. But then if we figure out how many genes are present in those, there's a vast excess of microbial genes in our body than human genes. Now, in all fairness, we heard Brent talk about how one human gene goes wild and gives lots and lots of different transcripts and lots of different functions. But I think in this case, we, the fact that there's a lot more microbial genes really is talking about a, a much greater range of function because uh, these microbial genes are coming from different phyla of organisms, very, very different organisms that have very, very different capabilities. Uh, we like to think of bacteria as master chemists because they can uh, grow on rocks, uh, they can live in boiling water, or they can live in Antarctica. They, they have tremendous uh, physiological biochemical capabilities, and we benefit from that, from carrying them around with us. Um, we know that the microbes were on the Earth billions of years ago, long before we were there, and as all life evolved, the microbes were regarding every new thing that came up as new interesting habitats for them to occupy. And so everybody has a microbiome, all the plants and animals. Uh, and, and in our case, uh, we are so tightly integrated with our microbes that we can carry this tremendous constellation of organisms that provide us with lots of additional functions than we have in our genome and live in harmony. Everything is OK. So, Given, given that, given that we have this tremendous uh, microbial content, and this has actually been known for a while, but it's been very difficult to study because of the sheer scale of the problem of enumerating and studying them. And it's not until next generation sequencing came along that we could now do this in a really facile manner and, and handle hundreds, if not thousands, of samples and sample them deeply enough. Because in that slide of the saliva I showed you, that was based on just taking saliva, extracting all the DNA, and just sequencing the heck out of it and seeing everything that was there. Um, many of those organisms had never been cultured. It would be very, very difficult to do that by classical methods. So it was really the awesome power of DNA sequencing uh, that, that has been able to drive this field and give it the momentum that it's got right now. So we've known about it, but we haven't been able to study it. And we're right at the very beginning of a new field where uh, attention to the microbiome now is going to change medical practice. And what I'd like to do is just give you a few examples to give you a kind of concrete intuition about where this is going, because like I say, we're right at the very beginning of this. So this is sort of the, the poster child for something that uh, 
microbiome uh, application is having an effect in medicine. This is the um, uh, concept that you can treat people who have Clostridium difficile diarrhea, a condition that's very, very difficult to correct with antibiotics or other treatments by giving them a fecal transplant. In other words, introducing a healthy microbiome from somebody else, uh, that, that can cure it. Uh, people who have, uh, you know, how do you get Clostridium difficile diarrhea? Uh, one simple way to think about it is you go into the hospital, you're going to have surgery, you're given some antibiotics prophylactically, everything goes fine with the surgery, but you've altered your microbiome by the antibiotic treatment. And if you happen to have Clostridium difficile in your gut, and it had been held in check by all the other microbes that were there, and now you've beaten those down, it is antibiotic resistance, and it can overgrow and makes toxins, causes diarrhea. And now the problem is, how do you return it back to the state that you had before, where it was a minor player and the other organisms were keeping it in check. Very difficult to reverse that. So the observation has been that if you take uh, stool samples from healthy people and make an extract and introduce that into the gut, now the microbiome returns to a, a non-diarrheic state. Um, people are healthy again, and that's a treatment that works when antibiotics and other things didn't work so well. We don't really understand how that works. Um, it could be you're just introducing a lot of beneficial bacteria or neutral bacteria, and they're outcompeting C. diff, and um, so it loses its, its predominance. It could be some more specific interactions between individual bacteria, because as I'll say in just a minute, um, in these communities, uh, the microorganisms are in conflict. This is ecological warfare. This is trying to compete for ownership of the niche and predator-prey relations, and all of those things come into play. And so it could be very specific interactions between bacteria, and it just happens that if you take a whole slug of your gut bacteria and put them in there, some of the, the specific interactions can now be brought to bear against C. diff. We don't really know. This is, this is again, we're right at the very beginning of this. But the idea of doing a transplant as, as a way of treating not just this particular condition, but that many other conditions that are difficult to correct uh, is, is a very interesting one, and one that I think is going to be So um, this is one of our favorite uh, sources of information about the microbiome. And uh, as we just talked about with C. difficile, without really knowing what's going on, this is a source of a therapeutic. But uh, in fact, there's, there's much, much more to be learned about the gut microbial community from studying stool samples and fecal samples. And, and here's one example of that. This is uh, some work that was done by Brett Finley in British Columbia. Um, he was studying uh, effect of microbiome on salmonella infections. And, and the basic experiment that he's done, again, he starts out with feces from healthy people and he wanted to know if there are small molecules, uh, uh, metabolites that bacteria are excreting that could be used to control salmonella infection or somehow or other interfere with it. And so he made an extract. And uh, as you can see, he found that that extract contained within it a small molecule that was an inhibitor of the expression of invasion genes of salmonella. Part of the salmonella infective process is to invade the host cells and become intracellular. And there's a set of genes that salmonella has that's part of that whole process. And in these fecal extracts from healthy people were inhibitors of the expression of those invasion genes. So it's fairly specific because we're looking at gene expression of a particular set of genes. It's, it's, it's a, this is some kind of regulatory property. And in further characterization, they were able to show that there's a particular clostridial species um, that uh, if you take, uh, purify that organism again from uh, the human gut, uh, that organism is making something in its supernatant that has the same property. Maybe that's the organism in the fecal extract that was making this inhibitor as well. So, and then down here we have the assay itself this is the number of uh, salmonellas that became intracellular. And so here is the control in the assay. 
and then after treating with the extract, you see this goes down by logs. This is, you know, uh, 0.03 significance or something like that. So this is highly statistically significant in terms of what's happening here. So um, <clears throat> we go back to this idea that the microbiome has a lot of complex interactions just between individual bacteria, and that really understanding this, when we get down to the molecular level, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, it may be that if mm -hmm. uh, the treatment of um, Clostridium difficile diarrhea and finding something against Clostridium difficile is this specific, you might someday be able to have a small molecule that you manufacture and you introduce in that targets some property of Clostridium difficile and knocks it down, rather than having to do sort of the nuclear option of, of massive antibiotics or something as ucky as a fecal transplant or something like that. And at the end of this paper, uh, Finley and his colleagues said, our work suggests that the gut metabolome, so now they're just talking about the small molecules that the bacteria are making, is an unexplored source of biologically active material that should be mined for their avirulence properties and perhaps other biologically. So that stool sample is actually a gold mine. There's a lot of things in there being produced by a lot of different bacteria. And this field, as time goes on, I think is going to tease out those things and produce very, very interesting molecules of medical importance. So um, one other example, and this is the kind of typical experiment that's done in metagenomics. You have uh, a case in control populations, and you um, look at their microbiome by doing sequencing and making a list of what taxa are there and the relative abundance, and you compare the case to the control, and you try to find what are the differences there and what could be correlated with the disease. And the particular case I've chosen here is a paper that looked at um, 39 kids, half of whom were autistic and half of whom were considered neurotypical. And um, these are four particular bacteria that showed significant differences in their abundances in the two uh, cases. And in particular, if we just look at this Prevotella species, um, this was the one that, that showed the biggest difference. Um, here was something that might be correlated with autism. It could be potentially, doesn't necessarily mean that it's causative. It could be a diagnostic. If it's just correlated, it could be a different way of recognizing this. Uh, as the authors wrote, the findings from this study are stepping stones for better understanding of the crosstalk between the gut microbiota and autism. I forgot to tell you, those were stool samples, again, um, which may provide potential targets for diagnosis or treatment. So imagine if there really is um, something in the mechanism of, of some part of the autistic syndrome that is related to uh, dysbiosis of the bacteria in the gut, maybe some small molecules that are made that affect neurodevelopment or something like that. And um, you could screen babies, look in their diapers, and we with, uh, are very fond of collecting all the diapers in the neonatal intensive care unit. We did this at, in St. Louis, and, and we're now doing it here in Connecticut as well. Uh, and, and you could set up assays just by analyzing the stool samples for lots of different things like this. You could potentially have very sophisticated and interesting new diagnostics that would allow you to intervene more early than waiting until the full clinical presentation had developed. So um, that pretty much wraps it up. Just to, just to summarize, we talked a little bit about antagonists of uh, infectious agents, uh, biomarkers for different kinds of diagnoses. And, and we literally have 40 or 50 collaborations with physicians, each of which have some different condition like autism. And we always find a difference in the microbial communities. And so there's always the possibility that there's something there that's going to really develop into uh, an important clinical home run. Uh, therapeutics for uh, correcting abnormal microbiomes, such as the treatment for C. diff diarrhea. Uh, I haven't talked about the fact that the microbiome affects the efficacy of vaccines. Um, then there's more far out things. Can we engineer microbiomes? Could we make bacteria that are overproducing uh, an amino acid or something to correct an inborn error of metabolism? Something like that. 
Uh, and then at the bottom of all of this, of course, is just getting a mechanistic understanding for things that uh, we don't really know the reason, but it's really very microbiome related. So many exciting developments to come. I think that's the bottom line. We're just at the very beginning of this. So thanks very much. Thank you.